Um, this example is just showing that if the husband, and if you're in parentheses in my presentation, then you have passed on. Um, so the husband has passed away. One half of his estate would go to his wife. The other fourth would be split among his two children. So the other half gets split, a fourth to child one, a fourth to child two. If those people are minors, if those children are minors, then we have to go get a, something called a conservatorship in the probate court, which is also the same um, procedure that we have to do if someone's incapacitated. We have to really kind of look out for second marriages because the South Carolina law doesn't really anticipate that you would have anything more than a traditional marriage um, or that you might have been married before with children from a prior marriage. And we always need to look out for your beneficiary designations on like insurance, your retirement accounts, and those types of things, and try not to name any minor children for that. Now, when you are married, then your spouse has the right to something called the elective share. The elective share is one-third of your estate. So if I pass away now, and even if my will says I leave everything to um, to the church, let's say. My husband has a right to interrupt that estate plan and come into my estate in probate court and take one-third. Um, so a lot of people, even in a second marriage, might say, I want my spouse to have, um, to have none of my estate and I want it all to go to my kids. Well, that doesn't work. Well, it could work, but we need to have an agreement of some way, shape, or form with your current spouse. So you could do that. Um, waiver of an elective share through a prenuptial agreement, um, through a trust, or by having them sign an elective share waiver. Now, in the estate planning world, this is just a little timeline. So, from your date of birth until your date of death, then during your lifetime, you need some documents for managing your affairs if you couldn't do it for yourself. So, you need a financial durable power of attorney. Um, a durable health care power of attorney, and then possibly a living will. And then when you pass away, then we would go through probate. Probate usually takes about a year, but there are some summary procedures, which we can talk about. And then your will or even a revocable trust would um, operate after that to transfer your assets to your beneficiaries. So this is kind of... Um, just an example of if you could just have a will for your estate plan, and that's fine. The will is like having a map to go through probate. So it's way better than dying in test state, because when you make a will, you're called a testator. Um, and so you die test state. <laughs> um, and that will then is just like having a better roadmap to go through probate, because now we know where we're going. It does not avoid probate in its entirety. In order to totally avoid probate, you would need something called a revocable trust, which is a trust agreement where we create a trust now, and then we would transfer assets to your trust. Now, have any of you heard of a revocable trust, or sometimes it's called a living trust? Yes. Yes. So you would create that now. It uses your social security number while you are living, and then when you pass away, it becomes irrevocable, and we get it its own tax ID number, and um, then your assets would be um, distributed according to the terms of that document. So a lot of times, it's a great benefit to have, um, to have a revocable trust because we skip all the time limits that probate has. So we talked about how probate could take up to a year, so in a revocable trust, we are not governed by those timelines. So you could do the probate or do the transfer of your assets a lot faster than you could otherwise do it. But you have to have some uh, enough assets to make the transactional cost because having a revocable trust is a little more expensive than just having a will. The other thing that a revocable trust does is it's a private document and it doesn't get filed anywhere. So you won't ever be able to go down to the courthouse and get a copy of it. Um, and I think that that protects you. And uh, it also protects your beneficiaries from anybody who might be interested in what they were getting from your estate. During your lifetime, 
your adorable power of attorney is important. Now, more than likely, if you have already a power of attorney, um, then it is more than likely a durable power of attorney. So there's a couple of different kinds. General, which is the kind that we use in estate planning the most. General is as broad as we make it. Or we could have a limited power of attorney. And you might have run into one of those, like when you were going to a real estate closing and you couldn't be there in person. You might have had somebody have a limited power of attorney just for that one transaction. I like to make your powers of attorney be immediate. So that the day that you sign that power of attorney, it's already effective and your agent can act for you. But the other way to do it is called a springing power of attorney. And a springing power of attorney um, means that it doesn't come into play until you are incapacitated or until you give your agent the ability to act. Um, and either way, then... The only way that your agent can make any transfers of your assets during your lifetime, even if you're incapacitated, is if you have a special gifting authorization to allow your agent to make gifts to your family or um, to any charities. So you also need, during your lifetime, some health care powers of attorney. So. In about, I think, 2006 is when we got the durable health care power of attorney, which allows you to make to name an agent. So there's two doctor, two advanced health care directives in South Carolina. There's the old living will, which we've had for years and years. But that document is just a directive from you straight to your doctor. And it says, I don't want to be on life support and I don't want artificial nutrition and hydration. It only applies if you are terminal and likely to die in a relatively short period of time or if you're in a permanent coma. But it doesn't apply in any other circumstance. So I used to get a lot of phone calls that would say, I know mom wouldn't want to live like this, but the doctor says she's not, in, she's not terminal and she's not in a permanent coma. So what can I do? And my answer used to be, there's nothing that you could do. We had to wait until she got worse. But now we have the health care power of attorney where you can appoint an agent. And if your loved one or you already have a health care power of attorney, there are choices on that power of attorney that I want you to double check. So it says, I'm going to name an agent. So now it's not up to the doctor on call, but it's up to me to have a conversation with my agent to make sure that they know what my wishes are. And then there are three different choices about um, life support and then also about artificial nutrition and hydration. And those are numbers uh, seven and eight on the form. So number seven is life support. It uh, has three different choices. Um, the very most restrictive one just says keep me on life support forever and never take me off. The second choice from the bottom, so the choice seven B, is actually this living will document in disguise. So it says, I don't want it artificial, or I don't want life support, but I only don't want it if I'm in a permanent coma or if I'm terminal. Well, I might need to make that decision for my loved one if they weren't in one of those two. So to make it broader, the very first choice under 7A and under 8A is full discretion to your agent. And so it allows your agent to have the ability to make that decision no matter what kind of circumstance that your loved one is in. And so that's what I prefer to have everybody sign, um, especially in these days of COVID-19, where we don't know if we're going to need to be in the hospital and we don't know um, if we need to be you know, on a feeding tube for a short period of time or um, on a later for a short period of time. So it's just important to be able to have those options because we used to think about using this healthcare power of attorney only at the very end stages of our lifetime. And it, it could be that we might need it before then. Now, when we think about all the people that you might need to name in your estate planning, they all have different names, but it's kind of different hats for this, sometimes the same person. 
So we used to call the person who um, executed your will, who's carried out your will, we used to call that the executor. Um, but did you know that's only the male version? <laughs> the female version is executrix. <laughs> so we updated our code long ago to um, have the more politically correct term personal representative. So that's what we call what used to be executors. If you have minor children involved, then you might need to name a guardian for them. If you have a trust, then you would need a trustee. That's the person who's in charge of your trust. And then we call the people who are named under your powers of attorney for health care and for financial purposes, we call those your agent. And we want to make sure that you always have an alternate because I never like to run out of people. And I've seen documents, um, even in the past year, where another attorney had drafted the documents and the um, client thought that they had everything that they needed, but the spouses had just named each other on their documents and didn't name an alternate. And when the spouse passed away, the other, the surviving spouse was already incapacitated and couldn't write a new power of attorney. And so we ended up in court trying to get a guardianship conservatorship for them. So it's always important to have an alternate and I like to, depending on the ages of those, um, the ages of those agents, then I like to just kind of make sure that we have maybe one extra, but maybe even two extra. Because it's likely that in this scenario, you may have the um, situation where we don't know which of your children might be the best at that point in time. And so usually I recommend that you know, up between the two of them, let's name them one at a time. I don't like to name them together, um, and I have lots of different reasons for that. But um, we can always have one of them resign to let the other one serve. And um, so I try to build in as much flexibility as we can. Now, some of you may think that probate is evil. And when I do this presentation in person, most of the audience raises their hand and says that, oh my gosh, we've been through probate with my mother. It was so horrible. I never want to do it again. Um, I want to be able to avoid probate. And there's a couple of different ways that we can accomplish that. One way is just through the titling of your assets. The other way is um, through that revocable trust that we talked about before. So when we look at what is a probate asset versus what is a non-probate asset, Anything that is in just your name, not a joint with rights of survivorship asset, so not a joint bank account, but just your name um, on a deed or just your name on a bank account or just your name on a vehicle, um, those types of assets will go through probate. If you have things titled with rights of survivorship, so when you look at the deed to your house, it's very specific, but for real estate, we have to have exact language on the deed that would allow it to pass automatically. So if your deed just says to husband and wife, that is not going to make it pass automatically. That's something called tenants in common. But it, if it says husband and wife, comma, joint with rights of survivorship, then that would pass automatically. Every bank account that you open at a bank would automatically have survivorship rights to it. You can also put on a bank account a transfer on death, TOD, or a payable on death, uh, POD um, designation on your account that you sign at the bank that says, when I pass away, then either leave this asset to these people or to my revocable trust. Um, and we want to also check on everything that has a beneficiary designation. So your life insurance, your retirement accounts, especially IRA money, 401k money, that money is really important to have um, a beneficiary titled on it because of the tax situation. So when you pass away, if there's not a beneficiary named on your IRA money, then um, it goes to your estate. But when it goes to your estate, it accelerates all the income taxes that you haven't paid. We have to take it out over a five-year period. Whereas if we can leave it to a beneficiary, then they have some more choices about it. 
not as many choices as they had before the SECURE Act, but now they'd have to take it out over a 10-year period, but that's still better than over a five-year period. But when you um, have a revocable trust, then it's important that we retitle all your assets. I haven't done you any favors if I've given you these beautiful documents, but I haven't looked behind it to make sure that all of your assets would be titled the right way. I see lots of clients who, are, who had been to a previous estate planning attorney and um, once they uh, got their documents done, I would say, you know, hey, did anybody ever ask you like what kind of um, assets that you own? And they'll say, oh, no, they never even asked me about my bank accounts or how I hold my real estate or any of those things. And so um, for that's how we know that they haven't really looked at your particular situation to make sure that you could avoid probate. I had a client who came to me recently. He said, we have a revocable trust. We need to update it. And I said, okay, well, let's look and see if you even need it in the first place. They didn't own any real estate and all of their accounts were joint accounts or beneficiary designation. And if that is the case, then he didn't need that revocable trust to avoid probate. He was already doing it. And so we could update his estate plan a little bit more simply. So the tricky spots are for checking your deed to make sure it has rights of survivorship. If we want to get really nitpicky, there's boats and automobiles. And maybe the car that you have right now is not the last car that you'll have. But if it's or, it passes automatically. If it's and, it goes through probate for one half of it. So just double check those types of things, or the next time you go to buy a car, you may want to change how it's titled. And you would do that with the DMV. And then um, anytime we have any titling with minor children, we want to make sure that's done appropriately under like the Uniform Gift to Minors Act account or those types of things. Oh, and we talked about your life insurance. Any annuities also would be another asset that would have a beneficiary designation on it. Um, you can have your IRA or your retirement plan beneficiary be a trust. And um, if, you, if in certain circumstances, currently and probably for most of you on this call, it's not necessary. Um, but we need to know that all those things match up together so that everything works together with your will or your revocable trust to ensure that your plan works when something happens to you. Now, a lot of people say that probate is evil, but mostly because of the time period that it takes. So it takes between eight months to a year, typically. There are some summary proceedings that you can do if you are a sole uh, surviving spouse and you are named as the personal representative in the will and the sole beneficiary. There are things that we can do if the assets that are going to go through probate are less than $25,000. Um, there, so there are some ways to avoid that full year long period, um, but that would all depend on your particular circumstances. And we talked about using a revocable trust for that or by checking on your titling. Um, when you avoid probate by using a trust, then there's no place for your um, heirs to really argue a lot about how you left it things for them because you haven't opened an estate in probate. Um, and your trustee can take over immediately. And it's a little bit easier. So if you have real estate in other counties or other states, then I usually recommend using a revocable trust to deed that property into the trust so that it would avoid probate because... If you go through probate, then you have to file for probate the, the county of your domicile and then the county or state of every other place that you own property. You have to do something called an ancillary proceeding where we have to file documents in that county as well and they have their own filing fees. Um, the filing fee for the probate court is one quarter of one percent. Uh, so South Carolina is not the most expensive place to go through probate. In places like New York, it could be as much as 8%. Uh, but um, So it's not terrible to go through probate here, but certainly the best gift that we can give to our loved ones is to have everything organized um, and put together so that it goes as smoothly as possible for them. So where should you keep your documents? 
We have to be able to find an original will when something happens to you. So I like to put them in the safe deposit box or in like a fireproof safe in your home. Um, I did have a client who had their uh, tiny little lock box that they had in their house. They, the thieves ran off with them. And don't you think they were disappointed when they cracked that sucker open and all it had were their estate planning documents on it? <laughs> but um, it could just be a place in your house where we know where to find it. Um, I had a client call me recently and she's like, I think my aunt left everything to me and this is the copy. She thought she had the original and she didn't, the aunt didn't have any children. And so the only other way to avoid that is to have every beneficiary who would have inherited to sign a document that says that they believe that that copy should be admitted as the original. And if one person doesn't agree, then your estate plan doesn't work like you thought. I also recommend that people update their documents every three to five years. Um, so, and it may be even longer, depending on your particular circumstance, that anytime you have something um, happen in your life, like if you got a divorce or if you um, got remarried or um, if something happened to one of your children, those types of things are uh, circumstances that might look get us to look back to make sure that everything still works the way that it needs to work. Or if something has happened to one of your agents or your personal representative that you've named, you certainly want to name another. When you go through probate, the probate court um, has the oversight. And so I always say that that's a chance for the least amount of shenanigans um, because in the trust arena, then there's not um, as much oversight. It's really up to your fiduciary, the trustee that you've named, and then the beneficiaries to keep them in check and be reasonably informed. Um, I don't like to recommend that you try to totally avoid probate just because um, we've got to have some assets available to pay debts and administrative costs. So we either need some cash in your revocable trust or in your estate to um, be able to pay those types of things or reimburse your personal representative for those types of costs so that we're not having to um, try to go to other beneficiaries to get the money back. So if you've got every bank account that you own designated for the same three beneficiaries, let's say, then you might have probate, you might have bankrupted your probate estate. So there's no money to like pay your final expenses or pay your funeral costs or those types of things. So we just need to make sure we always have um, some money available for that. And then I usually recommend that to have the right attorney, it needs to be somebody who does just this work. You really, really want your estate plan to work. Um, and after you pass away is way too late to find out that it might not. So I recommend being, getting somebody who is a South Carolina certified specialist. There's a list on um, their website that I've linked for you here. There's also a program called the South Carolina Lawyer Referral Program. And then, of course, if you have a friend who's used somebody that they really liked, then um, what a great way to be able to have um, you know another client come to me. is Because my clients who come from my other clients are some of my very best clients. Um, and so just want to be sure that you have somebody who's going to ask you about your assets and how they're titled and ask you about um, um, all of your circumstances in advance so that we make sure we cover all the bases. And that's really all I have for you as an overview. And I know you probably have some questions. Let me get to where, let me get this um, PowerPoint off the screen. All right, nobody be shy. <laughs> Oops, hold on. Erin, I have a question. Okay. Um, it, most of the stuff that you talked about specific to South Carolina, is it just different depending on what state you're in? Absolutely. So you want to have somebody in your state that is licensed. So 
um, all of us lawyers are tied to the bar exam of whatever state that we took if we didn't want to take it more than once. And so I only know what the, the laws are here. If you have your estate plan done here and you move someplace else, like I've had clients who've moved to Georgia, North Carolina, other places, then I just recommend that you have somebody there review the plan. It's likely that the differences are not so much that you wouldn't need a small tweak or that it might just cost like a consultation fee or something like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. And if you want to put an asset in a trust, do you need an attorney to do that for you? If you are doing a piece of real estate Mm -hmm. in South Carolina, then yes, you need an attorney to do that because that is the practice of law. Um, But it's not the same in Florida, for instance, because in Florida, attorneys um, are not the only people who are allowed to prepare deeds. They also have title companies there. So it's going to vary state by state. Okay. I know we had somebody ask about adding your name to bank accounts. Um, so I don't recommend that people add people's names to bank accounts on a regular basis. It works really well with spouses. It's just not really great among children. So if you have three children and you name one of them as the, um, as your joint owner of your bank account, then what happens is that that child is going to be the rights of survivorship owner of that account. And so they can then, they'll inherit the whole entire account. And that may be okay if everybody gets along. But if everybody doesn't get along, then we've got a whole other situation. Um, Or if you have a child on there and they get sued or they run up a bunch of credit card debt, then that makes your bank account be... um, available for that creditor to attach as one of their assets. So among um, parents versus children, then I usually recommend that we do a payable on death designation if that's appropriate or uh, some other way to title it or just use your power of attorney at the bank so that you would have them to be able to sign your checks and do it that way. Um, I, this is Mac. I, I have a question. Uh, we recently have uh, prepared a will, um, and in it we designate uh, beneficiaries between our children and grandchildren by percentage. Mm-hmm. Now, should we do the same thing in our TIA CREF or those other kind of assets? Should they, you know, they all say, what's your beneficiary? Should it be identical for what's in the will? If you want to make it all match up, I mean, the other thing that I would point out to you is that your money, that I'm assuming your TIA CREF is your retirement account, right? Yes. So you haven't paid income taxes on that money. Um, Right. One of the best ways to give money to charity is actually to do it through the money that you haven't paid income taxes on. So if you had like the church or any kind of other charity in your documents, then I've had people take that charity kind of out of their will and instead do it through the beneficiary designation for a similar percentage or a similar um, amount on their retirement account. Um, but if you've got your children named as the beneficiaries, then I would want it to match. But I don't want to leave it to any minor grandchildren. So hopefully, um, <laughs> looking at you, you might be old enough that your grandchildren are all of age. <laughs> Almost one year, and they okay. will be. <laughs> so we wouldn't want to do that for a minor child, but we could do it for anybody who's over eighteen. Okay. Other questions, and you you need to remove the mic, uh, the little uh, unmute yourself. There you go. Thank you. I have a question. Is there any negative to the? TOD or, or POD? I don't think so. Um, it allows your account um, to pass automatically to that person, and it avoids probate. I mean, the only thing that is that we would just still want to make sure that we have enough um, assets, you know, or money in your um, in an account somewhere to be able to pay your final expenses. But that doesn't take effect until you pass away. And you could change it as many times as you like. 
And what would some of those final expenses be? Like your funeral bill or any medical bills. Um, for the privilege of serving as your personal representative, then the law says that they can get paid for their services. They can get 5%. Um, or they may, you know, have some expenses that they pay out of pocket, like coming here to help sell the house or get the house ready to be sold or those types of things um, that we may need to pay some other people to do repairs or, you know, just those last final things that we would need to do before we were had everything wrapped up to be able to pay out all your beneficiaries. And Aaron, do you think you need, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Do you think um, you need an attorney as a personal representative? No. Men, grown children? Um, I think you should choose the person in your life that's the most organized and responsible. As an attorney, that's not what I want to do. I want to practice law. So mm -hmm. I would never, and I can't draft your will if you're going to name me. Mm -hmm. So, because that's a conflict of interest. So you would like to have, now if you don't have any children or anybody who is responsible, then you should use somebody like a bank or a trust company. And those people um, would manage your entire estate or, their, or your trust. Um, and they do that for a certain fee schedule, usually like a certain amount, you know, up to like $2,000 up to a certain amount of assets. And then after that, it's on a percentage basis. Okay. Can they like, can they sort of co-manage that with your children or do they just, they own that whole process? They like to own that whole process. And I don't like to have two people together just because it makes things overly complicated. Um, because if you have two personal representatives serving together, they have to co-sign everything. Um, so mm -hmm. that's dual signature checks at the bank. That's co-signing all the paperwork for the probate court. That's trying to sell the house on any kind of contracts. So I like to choose the person who's the most organized and responsible and trust them and then let them know that you want them to keep everybody in the loop. It doesn't mean they can't talk to them or that they can't seek out the information or their advice. It just means that they're not required to get their agreement. Because as soon as you name two people, then if they start to disagree, then now they're suing each other in the probate court. <laughs> and that's just going to um, up all of the fees and the administrative costs to administer your estate. Does that person, can that person be outside? outside of the state or do they need to be in the state? They can be anywhere. I've had, I've represented personal representatives that I've never met before. Um, and now that we have Zoom, um, we can make every place a lot smaller. <laughs> um, so in South Carolina, our probate process is called informal probate. Um, so everything can be done through the mail as long as that person. So I've just been emailing documents to people. Um, I have one in North Carolina right now. I email her the document. She prints it off. She signs it before a notary. She mails it back to me. And then we communicate via phone, via email, via Zoom, um, and take care of like the day to day, um, stuff that way. I have a question about the revocable. Uh, I've asked this question many times and never clearly understand the difference between revocable and irrevocable. Is the only difference that irrevocable, it cannot be changed? Yes, that's the only difference. So revocable means you can change okay. it. Okay. So you could change it just like you could create a new will. But the great thing about the revocable trust is once you set it up, and even if you've, and you've funded it with all of your assets, so we've deeded your house into it, we've changed how everything is titled at your bank, you could change the beneficiaries of your revocable trust and never have to retitle your assets again. Unlike a will where we still have to redo your beneficiary designations every time you make a new will. So if you have a will and it's not not revocable is that considered irrevocable well your will isn't one or the other because it doesn't come into effect until you pass away okay okay, <laughs> okay gotcha <laughs> i have a question um i want to ask a question can you hear me i can hear you yes. go ahead go ahead Aileen. okay um 
I wanted to know if something fits under which type power of attorney. When you're making routine medical decisions, like um, for someone and it's not, they're not in the hospital or anything, just does that go under the um, health care power of attorney or the general power of attorney? Health care power of attorney. Now, some attorneys do the document all as one. So some attorneys, I like to have a separate because the uh, health care power of attorney, our legislature has drafted the statutory form. And when you go to the hospital, I want the person there who's not trained legally to be to know what they're looking at. But some attorneys do put it all together in the durable power of attorney with health care provisions. So it just depends on how that attorney did it. I like for them to be separate. And then that way I don't have all of your financial powers in a document that's filed with your doctor and that kind of thing. And is a is a power of attorney any good at all, or does it have to be a durable power of attorney? Because they're two different things, right? Well, so durable just means it survives your incapacity. And we changed our law last year or the year before to say that it used to be you had to elect into making it durable. Now you have to elect out of making it durable. So durable just means if I'm incapacitated, if I can't make my own decisions, then my agent... Um, can act. So um, you would see typically there would be a provision that would say that my agent has the power to act even if I um, don't have the power um, to act for myself anymore. And then it survives your mental incapacity. Um, but now I left that same paragraph in mind just to be doubly sure, but the law actually says that it doesn't have to be in there like that anymore. That if the power of attorney is silent, if it was signed after, I guess, last year, then um, it's automatically durable. The only thing that people get sometimes tripped up on a little bit is that your power of attorney ends when someone passes away. So then we would need the next person to be handed off. So that power of attorney agent can't act anymore. They have to go either, we've got to go with the person who's appointed by as your personal representative or the person who's the trustee of your trust would then take over from there. And Aaron, that sounds like that's state law. So it would be different in different states. No, typically for your power of attorney or your health care power, that's going to end when that person passes away because you wouldn't still be able to act for them. They're both matters of contract. Mm -hmm. um, versus like a trust or a will, which is a you know much more of an end of life document. Other questions? Mm -hmm. One more. Um, not not quite as much on these lines, but what's involved in having somebody deemed incompetent or incapacitated? So that if you had that power of attorney, then you would be the one responsible. Well, so the document itself would more than likely um, define what that means. And so my document says if a, two doctors have said I can't make my own decision any longer or if I've resigned so, and signed something that says my agent can act, then if it was a springing power of attorney, then that agent would then be able to act. I like for my powers of attorney to be effective now, so that the date that you sign it, it's effective. I tell, I try to joke about, I'm like, you know what, I have a power of attorney for my husband, because every April, when it's time to do our taxes, I want to go to the beach, and I'm going to leave him here with the CPA and let him sign all that stuff. Um, I'm the girl who showed up at the Verizon Wireless store with a power of attorney one time when my husband was out of town. I need a new phone. Um, he's not here. They were like, we need to call him. I'm like, no, we don't need to call him because I have this handy document <laughs> that allows me to make decisions for him so long as it's in his best interest. And it's definitely in his best interest for me to have a phone. <laughs> so a lot of people would say that that power of attorney is only for when that person's incapacitated, but it's very handy. For a <laughs> Does that work for all of the different utilities and things <laughs> Or under my husband's name? Yes, it would. <laughs> I need that. You would probably have to get put it on file with Dominion, let's say. 
So you would put it on file with them. They would send it to their legal department. They would have somebody approve it. Um, so it's not like it's immediate, but then you would have all of the access to that. It's the same thing like Verizon Wireless is always like one cell phone account is in one person's name and nobody else can access it. They've gotten a little bit better about that, but um, in the beginning, that's how it was the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I have a question. Uh, uh, if you, If somebody has a trust and they have their power of attorney and their health agent... But one of those people, since they made the trust, has become uh, unable to make decisions. How does that get changed when that person is now unable to make decisions and yet they've already signed everything in there? That's why we have an alternate. So let's say you are the trustee of your own revocable trust. You become incapacitated. You've named the alternate. But the the language is going to say... If that agent is incapacitated, if they resign, or if they refuse to serve, then we have the next alternate. Okay. The other thing that I like to include in a trust agreement is I like to give that next person the power to appoint a third person. So I can give them a power to choose somebody else if they think that they won't be the right person. And that way we never run out of people. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Aaron, I, I have... Well, I have I have a, qu- a question. Um, what about this? The five wishes. My doctor's office had that and handed that out, and they seem to think that it's uh, if it's notarized, that it has a legal uh, true l- legal weight. It's true. It does. So the five wishes is just one example of a healthcare power of attorney. So long as it has um, a witness and a notary, then it's valid as a health care power of attorney. I think the five wishes are a little bit more detailed than I kind of want to get into, but <laughs> it's up to you. It's very detailed. I mean, it says who can visit you in the hospital and what kind of music you would like to play and those kind of things. <laughs> Um, but it's up to you. So you can choose to have the five wishes or you can choose to have the statutory form or there are variations um, out there for different ones. But our state statute says that so long as it is notarized and witnessed that it would stand as a health care power of attorney. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Aaron, uh, in general, this you're talking to a group of caregivers. Um at what point would you advise folks to be considering um, executing these legal documents that you've talked to, either for themselves or for their loved ones? Like right now. <laughs> um, I would want to make sure that things are in place now before it gets to be too late. I did have a client recently come to me. Her husband had been um, diagnosed with some cognitive impairment. By the time I met with him, they wanted to make some sleeping changes, and I had never met them before, and he was just too far gone to be able to make a new will. Um, So we were going to be stuck with his prior estate planning documents, which wasn't going to be bad, um, but it just wouldn't have been exactly what she was saying that they wanted, or that he was saying that they wanted. I just didn't know that he knew enough about what was going on um, to be able to make those decisions any longer. So you want to make sure and look at those documents now to make sure that there aren't any surprises later because um, if you can get your um, loved one to share them with you, at least to, in order to be able to make sure that you can find the original, because uh, we'll definitely need that if it's just a will, um, Then and then to kind of double check and make sure that everything is going to go the way that they wanted it to, then let's double check that now. And then we'll know, you know, that it'll be good for um, later when we really need those documents. Okay. Other questions? Um, If someone is a... um, if they're, uh, can you have an alternate uh, personal representative? Absolutely. You can have as many as you want. Usually it's just depending on how, how old people are. So, like, if you name your spouse as your alternate, of course you're going to name your spouse. That's fine. 
But the next person in line doesn't need to be the same age as both of you. We need to have some kind of progression. You know, if everybody dies in the right order, it should work perfectly. But we don't always know about that. Can personal representatives resign? Yes. So I had a, a case last year where um, the mother and the daughter had been estranged, but the mother wanted to name a cousin. And um, the cousin wasn't going to get paid for it, and the daughter was going to get part of it. And anyway, I just t we talked about it, and I said, do you really want to do this job and have all of the headache, or do you want to just let her do it? And so the daughter, we ended up letting the daughter um, be the personal representative. Um, I had listed her as an alternate in the line just in case things had changed. And so she, we had to get two people to resign in order to get to her. But that way we got her appointed as the agent and um, just from the get-go. And then she was able to complete that. Okay. All right. Anybody else? And if you think of other questions, um, send them my email, Tim, and send them okay. the handout that has my information. Um, because I'm glad to answer any questions that you might have. Um, the way that my process works is to be a client of mine, you have to fill out a, a worksheet for me. And that's on my website, or I can email you one, or I can even snail mail you one if you don't have a printer. Um, but I'm very impressed with all the technological savviness that we have going on in this group. Um, but just, I'm glad to just answer the questions. If you think of something later, you can shoot me an email, or you can give me a call, and um, we'll see what we can do. Um, all right. Well, um, if there are no other questions, um, I'll let I'll remind everyone that we've recorded this meeting and we will offer a link to everyone um, so that if there was something that she talked about that sort of buzzed through your brain and you didn't remember it tomorrow, um, <laughs> and look at this link and refresh your memory. Um, but I want to thank um, Aaron very, very much for taking this time on a Sunday. I know it's taking away from your husband. Um, and uh, your private time, and thank you very, very much for appearing and, and answering our questions and giving us some information. So thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Aaron. All right. Y'all have a wonderful evening. All right. Thank you. You as well. Um, to the rest of the uh, group, uh, a reminder that this is our first uh, meeting of the month and of the year, and we will be meeting again on um, on the 24th. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, and Chris has gone to um, play with his uh, youth, um, with a church youth group. Um, did before I close us with prayer, did anyone else have anything to add or to say or any comments on on Aaron's presentation? I hope it was helpful. For, it was really great. Yeah, it was good. Thank you so much for setting that up. Not a problem. Not a problem. Thank, and, thank and, you for allowing us to join. Uh, anytime. Anytime. This is an open door, as my friends know. Um and I like to get the more, the better, um, because I think there are a lot of issues here that a lot of people can benefit from. Um, and a reminder also that in addition to passing on the recording link, um, I will also um, send to you um, uh, the handout that she talked about. Um, so if there's anything there, it's it's meant for non-lawyers, the, the handout. So hopefully that will um, benefit you as well. All right. Well, let's um